It's that time of the week again, ladies and gentlemen. Urban's Take with Tim May. Urban Meyer, three-time national championship uh, winning football coach, joins me. Uh, Urban, let's just get right into it, man. You guys are back on the, the Prime Express. I think you're going to be back in Boulder this week, right? USC, Southern Cal at uh, at Colorado. Colorado coming off that beat down last week. Uh, they, you know, I don't know if they came back down to earth or uh, came back down to reality, but uh, – Number one, why are you guys there? And I, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, it's still a compelling story, isn't it? Oh, it's still a great story. And I, uh, uh, you know, why are we there? Look at the numbers. When we yeah. got out there in the past, we, you know, we we dominated the airwaves. I mean, everybody's intrigued by this, and rightfully so. It's an incredible job that Dion and his coaching staff, and the most important, his players have done. But reality is upon us. And reality is, they went to Oregon and got just. Uh, got beat badly and then this one's not going to be good this one's uh usc I, i've i've not really studied usc but you're talking about this quarterback and i talked to cliff Kingsbury, kingsbury and then i also matt liner who knows that i'm telling you now this guy is you know i say marvin harrison's the best player in college football i, I don't know i think it's right there uh but this kid when you really and i'm not stuck I'm, I'm i'm honest about that i have not studied him like i had now yeah my god be a He's as good as I've ever seen. Wow. Wow. I mean, we're talking Caleb, Caleb Williams. Williams. We're talking about Caleb Williams. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, let me ask you this, though. Everybody thinks this, and and I'm not sure there's enough of this uh, to keep up with Southern Cal. But let's face it, uh, Southern Cal's had trouble defensively for a couple of – going on a couple of seasons now and stuff. You hired Alex Grinch a long time ago to come to Ohio State. He only stayed one year and went to Oklahoma. But uh, – what is the problem there that you see with Southern Cal defensively? Yeah, they were bad last year. I think they're better this year. Uh, I think he's an excellent coach. I think, you know, historically when you have a, a coach like Coach Riley who calls plays and it's he's really, you know, historically, you know, the defenses aren't that good. You know, that's – I think Bob Stoops is one of the few guys that, you know, he was so enamored with defense, but he let the offense become a real offense, you know, yeah. and – you know, I was enamored with offense because that was I was I was an offense coach my entire career. But I tell you what, I knew the value, and I I would always say, uh, you want to look at our salaries of our coaches. The defense coaches get paid more, yeah. Because I, you know, we're going to run my uh, our offense. I want to hire the best defense coaches I can get my hands on because uh, you know the, the chance you can win, but you can't win at all unless you're yeah. playing good. Defense. And I I believe in Alex Grinch. I think I know him. I really like the guy. I really admire his coaching ability. He's an excellent coach. I think this is program wise that I think they're getting better, but uh, you know, and I don't know Lincoln Riley very well. I got a lot of respect for him, but I just think that, you know, you, you need to have your hands on that defense a little bit. Yeah. And he, and just see, it just seems like uh, personnel wise, they were lagging behind what they assembled offensively, you know, through the, through the transfer portal, et cetera. Hey, real quick, if uh, Colorado gets Travis Hunter back, that's, uh, you know, obviously you dealt with that lacerated liver that happened uh, uh, against Colorado State. If they get him back, it it helps a little, right? I mean, he's it a helps, great player. It, it, it helps more than a little, but, you know, they're going to be very cautious. You're not talking about a sprained ankle here. Yeah. You're talking about an internal injury that, you know, I, I once again, I don't, I'm, I, I'll know more when I, I get there actually today, uh, but uh, it's, it's going to help a little, but, and I made this comment after I left uh, when I watched them practice. I, this is going to be a really good team. And I said, you know what a really good team is? They're winning half their games. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think when they shocked the world a little bit, then shocked me, but they shocked the world a little bit early on. And everybody's talking about national championship, you know, contender, big pack 12. They're not. And Dion, uh, Coach Prime said that, that, you know, they're not there yet, but they're marked, I mean, so much better than a year ago. All right. Uh, let's jump number two. Uh, you saw how Ryan Day reacted or vented after Ohio State won at Notre Dame on what turned out to be the next to last play of the game. Um, they put one second back on the clock after that dramatic touchdown, that ridiculous two-minute drill drive, a minute and 25 seconds they drove down. Uh, Chip Trainum scores a winning touchdown. Cal McCord hits some ridiculous passes. In that play, I mean, it all, it almost went according to script for a two minute offense. He missed some throws, obviously, in that time, but uh, when he needed to make a big throw, he did. But but Ryan Day erupted, and a lot of that was vented or aimed at uh, Lou Holtz, your your old mentor, 
but I think it was a shotgun blast at a lot of people, the way Ryan Day talked about the toughness of the team and being questioned, et cetera. Just what was your take on the way he erupted after that game? And what's your take on Ohio State winning a game like that? Oh, I got a lot of takes. You know, first, <laughs> I know I, you do. <laughs> I, I, my admiration and, and respect for Ryan Day is immense. It's, it's, we, we hired him. And he's a great, I mean, I, I hear things once in a while. Once again, I get it because you're, you're getting paid a lot of money. You're at the ultimate place. And I told you the job description now. Gene handed it to me, Gene Smith. Yeah. And I said, win every game you play. Yeah. And I thought, I remember going, because I, I knew that was kind of behind it. Like at Florida, no one ever said that to me. But I actually had a sheet of paper that said, win every game you play. And that makes you think, wait a minute. Wow, this is real. I'm not sure how many schools can say that. You know, Alabama would be one. And uh, I don't know. Yeah. You know, uh, so the reality is the pressure is immense. You get, it's your choice to be the coach at Ohio State. And with that comes, and a player, with that comes enormous scrutiny. So that's fine. But it also, he's a human, human being. And if someone criticizes Ryan Day for fighting for his team and fight for himself, you're an idiot. You know, you and I hate to be so grump, but I get so angry sometimes when someone's going to criticize Ryan Day for saying what's on his heart. But media or some other buffoon can say, I'm not saying Coach Holtz is a buffoon because I love Coach Holtz. But that's, that's between those two. Let Ryan Day say what he wants to say and move on. If you don't like it, that's fine. But do you understand, Ryan Day, they just won a game that his life would be different if they lost that game. And someone sticks a microphone in his face probably four minutes after it happened. Yeah. He is allowed to say what he wants to say. And you respect that because he did it. I whispered to him as he was leaving the locker room at the end of the night. I said, I, I, I kind of like this new Ryan Day. <laughs> he started, he smiled at me. But uh, you know what I'm talking about because you always told us exactly what was on your mind no matter what, you know, there were obviously some time, sometimes you can't talk about things. Hey, speaking of Notre Dame, uh, they got a new, another huge game this week at Duke. I mean, um, I think we're going to find out as much about Duke as we are Notre Dame, but uh, what's your, what's your take on that kind of game coming after such a loss? And, you know, we're going to get into at the end of this, at the checkmate moment, what happened with Notre Dame at the end of that game <laughs> uh, against well, Ohio here, State. But, Here's my thoughts, Tim, that you and Brady Quinn and I talk about this all the time. Notre Dame is so unique. Yeah. When I coached there for those, I think it was six years, is that when you lose a game, every time you break down like one, two, three team, one, two, three, a lot of times when I was there with Lou Holtz, it was one, two, three national champs. Yeah. And reality is when you lose one game, certainly when you lose two, that's gone. So you don't have a conference championship to play for. So I, you know, at Ohio State, you get a lot of rings when you win championships and all that. At Notre Dame, you don't get it. You know, you get a bowl ring. I remember I have, like, a Fiesta Bowl ring or something like that. We lost the game, and I'm like, I'd never wear that. Yeah. You know, you don't yeah. have that conference. You know, at Ohio State, if you lose a game, you're still in a street fight to go to the Big Ten Championship game to the Rose Bowl. For At Notre Dame, the players, the the fans, the the mindset is boom or bust. And if they lose, I, I worry about the mindset. That's where Coach Freeman and his staff's got to do, and his leadership of his team. They yeah. got to be phenomenal because right now they are they are injured. They're an, an injured animal right now. Yeah, they're going this game against a very well coach. I think that coach at Duke, my gosh, is he doing a great job? Elko. It, I don't know what the point spread is, but watch that game closely. Yeah. Well, speaking of games, I think the game of the week. I mean, is uh. Kansas at Texas, only because Texas is number th number three in the country. Kansas is number 24. Lance Leipold, though, is doing a hell of a job at Kansas. Hell of a job. Yeah. And they upset. They only had two wins two years ago in his first year there, but one of them was an upset win at Texas. And uh, I don't know, what what kind of chance do you give Kansas going into Texas this year? Because, you know, it looks like Kansas with Jalen Daniels, at quarterback. I mean, that's a damn good football team. But Texas just seems a cut above than it's been several years. I think a big difference is that defensive line as much as it, it is Quinn Ewers in that offense, but what's your take? Yeah, I think the coach of Kansas is, is phenomenal. I think, you know, uh, even the initial impact he's made, you don't think of Kansas as the old Kansas anymore. I certainly don't. I think they're a they're competitor in the Big 12. Before, you just thought they were a mess. Uh, so I think he is – and that quarterback, we did a special on him last year on Big New. Yeah. So I, but the, the, this is a whole different Texas. This is a whole different deal, man. 
This yeah. is one of the most talented rosters in college football. They're well coached. They went to Tuscaloosa and and beat. They didn't upset. They beat Alabama. I have them as my number one team in America. Uh, I think they beat Kansas, but I'm not taking away from what Kansas. Uh, I I I just like Lawrence too. I've been there a couple of times. Yeah. I just never quite understood why Lawrence Kansas can't can't have a good quality football team and. Now they have a good quality football coach, and they have. They remember Mangino and oh yeah, you know they had Glenn Mason. They had some good teams. So Kansas, you just got to you know. I hope this coach stays there because he's really doing a great job there. I was going to say back in the day at Pepper Rogers. I mean, they I saw them play against Penn State in the Orange Bowl way back in '67 or something. You know, I mean that's how far I go back, Urban. You were just you a go pips- back for the- You were just a little pipsqueak at that point, uh, barely barely out of diapers. But uh, I wanted to ask you this, Washington. Michael Penix wow. Jr., number seven in the country. Is Washington getting its just due, in your opinion? I mean, is it underrated? Is it right where it should be at this point? And uh, we'll get into Michael Penix Jr. You know, where is he on your Heisman watch list? That's about three takes, three urban takes in one there. But uh, what's your take on – I think Washington's laying out there in the weeds, man. <laughs> I think they're, they're playoff. You know, I'm, I'm my whole top four is now in, in chaos like everybody's. Yeah. I, I, cause I just don't, I, I should do a better job with that. Cause we cover them the PAC 12. I can tell you everything about the big 10, um, a lot about the big 12, but now I am. And they are a top four team right now. You know, I don't know if I got, I'm, I got to, I'm going to get on a plane and digest this again, but I've started really watching. And once again, you talk about a coach of the year candidate candidate at Washington, the war. Yeah. I mean, excellent. And Kyle Whittingham told me, he said, you know, the coaching right now, you have Oregon state, you have Washington State. You obviously have Utah. You have USC. You have Chip Kelly. You're telling me, and then obviously Washington. Those, that's that's the second best conference, arguably the best conference in America right now. They have yeah. quarterbacks. They have seven quarterbacks who can play anywhere in the country. They have skilled players all over the place. And and what makes you nuts? The Pac-12 is going away. How does that happen? I don't have an idea. I mean, think about the players out there, right? Think about the coaches. That might be the best group of coaches put together of all conferences. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's it, it is, but it's modern times. You and I talked about that on an earlier Urban's take, man. It's like it's chasing the cash, baby. It's chasing the cash. But uh, hey, real, but uh, I, I'm, I'm stammering because I think this is as wide open a college football playoff in the last year of the four team race. We have you have really no idea who's going to be those final four right now, right? I mean, no, you have you know. I always I put uh, a body of work number one and talent roster number two. Yeah, and body of work right now is it's it's uh, Texas and then Florida State. They have the best body of work. Yeah, uh, but there's there's some like the minute you say Alabama, you know, what are you kidding me? They're going to be somehow scratching and clawing it. And the team that's kind of rebound, they have an excellent coach as well as Brian Kelly at LSU. Yep. You know, their, their talent, the roster is there. Alabama, don't don't ever someone say, boy, Alabama's down. You're nuts. You're out of your mind. They're not down. They yeah. maybe have some issues. Same with LSU. Well, LSU's not very good. What, what are you talking about? So I, I agree with you, and I think it's so compelling for, uh, for college football. It's the way it should be. There's parity right now. If you can guess, and I don't know the Vegas odds and all that, but you count, you count USC and Washington out. You know, you count Florida State out. And I'm counting LSU, uh, count them out. And then you got, obviously, I, you know, what's funny is every time they ask me to my big 10, I, uh, I call it the game. One of the slots is going to be on that November 20 set, whatever it is, that game. Yeah. You know what game I'm talking about, right? Yeah. The, the winner of that game. Will be in, <laughs> yeah. That, that, that game, the winner of that game will be in the playoff. Yeah. And of course, maybe the winner of LSU and Alabama, one of them will, will eliminate the other, right? That's the way it right. goes. Uh, that's the way, uh, like you said, the Pac-12 is about to cannibalize itself, you know, with uh, everybody playing each other. All right. Hey, last thing here, checkmate moment. Yeah, State has the ball. You had State the, uh, Go ahead. You had the fourth or the uh, last play. I, I think the checkmate moment was third and 19. Okay. I think that's one of the greatest plays, you know, that Kyle McCord, a young starter, uh, that situation, your success rate on that, your success rate on getting one yard is pretty high. You know, you're, you're going to get that. That should yeah. be, we used to have an analytics. It was 80% of the time, you know, third and short, fourth and short, you should get that. 
you're Ohio State, you got good players, you got, you know, you're going to, you know, I don't know if they would have if they had 11 guys on the field, which is a whole nother story. Uh, but uh, the checkmate moment was third down to 19 when they ran uh, four, with, by the way, 15 seconds left and no timeouts. That's one of the greatest plays. Uh, you know, it's awful bold statement to say it's one of the great plays in Ohio State history. But it, it is. is. It is. Absolutely it is. But there were several on that play. On that, but I wanted to get to this, the checkmate moment. From a, from, a, from a chess standpoint, when you only go to the line of scrimmage with 10 guys on your defense, two straight plays after Ohio State gets to the one-yard line, I don't know, man. How do, I, I heard Marcus Freeman's explanation. How do you explain that to your team and your fandom and and keep a straight face? I mean, that's – like you said, Notre heard. Dame really has no, no, no room for error in a schedule, and they've got that game. You know, go ahead. Yeah, I, I obviously you knew that after losses, it took me months, especially if I felt like, and there's a cut, you know, the 2015 yeah. Michigan State loss to the, I'm, you know, that's how many years ago, and it's still all good flashbacks of what we could have done better because I really felt that was coaching error, you know, and and if you lose a game because a team better or you're something's going on, and, and you know that's one thing, but when you think that, my gosh, you know. I look at that Michigan State loss and we were how talented we were. I know Zeke was in a hospital for a few days before that. I, I don't want to go back there, but yeah. I'm re I'm I'm correlating that to what Marcus Freeman, who is an excellent coach. Obviously, I love the guy. Uh, we all I I really want him to be successful. He's a Buckeye. He's a you know he's at a great school, in Notre Dame. But when you look at that, it's inexplainable. It, it's something that you know there was a timeout, yeah. and you ran eleven guys on the field. Yeah. They ran an incomplete pass. And I even saw that because I was watching it in real time. Like, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. There's no one on the left side of the line. Yeah. And then they did it again. And Ohio State substituted. So that means the official would have stood over the ball. And Notre Dame could have ran a whole new group on the field. Yeah. And I, you know, and I saw some headline, they're going to change the way they, I'm like, my God, you know, I, I don't know. And I don't want to beat people up over that, but that's, that's one of those ones you're like, I'm not sure I've ever seen that. Yeah, personnel group, somebody missed their call, but, you know, somebody should be counting in the press box. Hey, Urban, totally enjoyed it, my man. Uh, by the way, uh, you guys, big noon kickoff going to uh, Boulder all these times. You're going to end up paying Colorado income tax, I think, man. When this is all said and done, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, i got to have my account look at that because I think Colorado tax is much higher than Florida. So. Yes, it is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Urban Meyer with Urban's Take. Uh, Urban, thanks for joining me again, man. We'll see you next week. Thanks, brother.